government on the first anniversary of the Trump administration. The political finger pointing is in full force all the way from Capitol Hill. Happy anniversary, Mr. President. Your wish came true. You wanted to shut down the Trump shutdown is all yours. We do some crazy things in Washington, but this is utter madness. Negotiating with this White House is like negotiating with Jell-O. It's next to impossible. To the White House, where callers were greeted with a recording Saturday. Unfortunately, we cannot answer your call today because congressional Democrats are holding government funding, including funding for our troops and other national security priorities, hostage to an unrelated immigration debate. On day two, Washington's mess is already spreading around the country, as some landmarks shut down and non-essential government workers have been furloughed. Can the president, Republicans, and Democrats work together to reopen the government? House Speaker Paul Ryan, White House Budget Director Mick Mulvaney, and the number two Democrat in the Senate, Richard Durbin, are all here with us today. We'll also have plenty of political analysis to make sense of it all. And I'll have some personal thoughts on my last regular turn as host of this broadcast. It's all coming up right now, here on Face the Nation. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. I'm John Dickerson. It's day two of the shutdown, but on day three, when most federal employees go to work, the effects will really kick in. Can Congress and the president overcome the paralysis in Washington and work together to reopen the government? We begin today with House Speaker Paul Ryan. Welcome, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. So where are things in these negotiations as of right now? Well, first, let me just say, um, this is your last show. You're going from hanging out with the likes of Ryan and Mulvaney to hanging out with O'Donnell and King. You're in for a serious upgrade. I want to say congratulations on that. Thank um, you. So to the serious point, um, we are still in shutdown. We're waiting for the Senate Democrats to open the government back up. This is solely done by the Senate Democrats. It's absolutely meaningless. They shut down the government over a completely unrelated issue. And the bill that they're opposing is a bill that they support, which is just baffling to us. Children's health insurance, funding for our troops, keeping the government going. They shut it down over an unrelated immigration issue with a deadline weeks away. And what's, what's so baffling about this was we were negotiating in good faith on DACA all the same. We actually want to solve this problem. So it's not as if we were saying no way, no so how, no discussions. They blew up the negotiations that were already underway. I want to get to some of those issues in a minute, but where are we right now? Is there an agreement to maybe get get something going here before people we're, go to work we're, or We're waiting to Monday? see. We're basically waiting to see today whether the Senate will vote on this or not and have the votes for it. So the, as you know, the House passed a bill keeping the government funded. But what's going to change that they would vote on that? That bill, well, uh, what, what Leader McConnell is going to be offering is one that has a different date on it. We passed a bill keeping things funded to February 16th. He is going to bring up a bill keeping things funded to February 8th. Uh, we have agreed that we would accept that in the House. And so we will see uh, sometime today whether or not they have the votes for that. And that's really where we are right now. The president, you talk about blame for the Democrats and all that, but they're, they're not the only players in this. In 2013, the president, Donald Trump, as a civilian, said it always happens to be the top. I mean, the problems start from the top and have to get solved at the top. The top he was talking about was the presidency. So why is this president who came in as a negotiator who said he was going to fix Washington, why is he not contributory to this problem that we have a government, government Look, shutdown? As Republicans, we have some experience with futile gestures like government shutdown. You want to see some quotes? Let me give you one. Open the government. When you open the government, we'll open negotiations. That was Dick Durbin in 2013. Right, but I'm exactly talking about the what president, they were saying though, back not in those Dick days. Durbin. Well, the president came in saying, Washington's broken. I'm going to fix it. And this so, is exa we're exactly where we were. This is why he ran. This is what everybody doesn't like. What Donald Trump didn't shut down the government. Senate Democrats. Why, right. why did they call this the Schumer shutdown? Because Senate well, Democrats shut the down the government. The so, Republicans calling it the Schumer shutdown. I want to get uh, past all that. Here's the thing. No, but I, this, I just, John, let me get you there. Okay. You can't blame Donald Trump for the Senate Democrats shutting down the government. They shut down the government with no end game in sight. I frankly don't think they thought we were going to pass our bill. And when we passed our bill, funding children's health insurance, keeping the troops funded, preventing the medical device tax from, from kicking in in a few days, which worries everyone's health care costs. 
they would not pass that bill. That has nothing to do with President Trump. I'm not trying to assign blame. I'm trying to get, just figure out what's going on here. This is a very familiar play. We've been here before, yeah, exactly. as you say. And, and, and it's futile, it and, never works. But I wanna know why a president who came, just what's gone wrong? Why has he not been able to apply? He came in as the, the great negotiator. What is it that has made it impossible for a person who ran on fixing the it's, system unable to It's a good get question because this? we're so baffled. If we were saying, for instance, we are never going to do a DACA solution. We're going to kick these kids out. Then I might understand Democrats getting frustrated. But the, the, what's baffling about this, John, is we were in negotiations on how to solve this problem, and then they blew that up and stopped these negotiations. So our, we had Kevin McCarthy, representing House Republicans, who was negotiating with Dick Durbin and other leaders. That's what's here's baffling what they, about this. Here's what they say, and you had two Republicans in the Senate who voted against this funding measure for roughly similar reasons, which is the president's been a moving target. Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Republicans in the Senate said, we're spinning our wheels until we know where the president is. So the Democrats felt like, or this is their case anyway, they felt like he's a moving target, let's use this moment of leverage, as, as Republicans did with Obamacare in 2013. Which, was, about which, which didn't work and, and didn't... And, and I can look. Right. But it was something they cared about. Democrats care about this, too. I guess the question is. The question is, where's the president on this issue? Is that, and is he going to stay in one place? Yeah. So I think it's I think what president should do is leave room for negotiation to get a solution. That's exactly what he's doing. He's basically saying, in addition to a DACA solution, we have to have border security, including funding for a wall. We've got, we, he wants to get rid of the diversity visa program. And he want, we want to move from a system of immigration based on family relations to one based on right. skills and merit for what the economy needs. Perfectly common sense. Here's the issue. If we simply did DACA without incumbent reforms, then you'd have a DACA problem five years down the road. We want to fix the problem and the root cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. DACA is a symptom of a broken immigration pro system. We want to fix the root cause of this problem while we deal with DACA so that we don't have 700,000 more DACA kids in five years. That's perfectly common sense, and that's all the president is saying. I, I want to see if I can get your reaction to something that the Trump campaign has run. It's an ad they're running right now in the middle of these negotiations where everybody's thinking the other side has bad faith. Let's watch a little bit of it. I want to get your reaction about how this affects things. President Trump is right. Build the wall. Deport criminals. Stop illegal immigration now. Democrats who stand in our way will be complicit in every murder committed by illegal immigrants. Are Democrats complicit? Well, they're certainly not helping us keep the government open. They're certainly not helping us getting into a solution on immigration. When you shut down the government you, and stop negotiating on immigration reform, they're complicit with not getting things done. But are they complicit in murders? And Look, I, I, I'm not going to comment on that. I just saw that. I don't know if that's necessarily productive. It's no secret the president has strong views on immigration, but what is not productive is a pointless government shutdown that the Senate Democrats have foisted on this country. Just so you know, you, you said this in your opening, tomorrow people don't get paid, people get furloughed. Right. We, the, we have soldiers fighting for us, troops overseas fighting for us who will not be getting paid. Well, this it, is ridiculous. You know, and so look, we've done this before, it didn't work. It's not working now. Look, let me just give you a quick. Chuck Schumer on, said. Hold on, but wait. We, we, there are military. This military question is important, though. I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but but you know, in 2013, the president, then candidate Trump, said, "Here's the truth: the government doesn't shut down. All essential uh, services continue. Don't believe the lies." On this question of the military, yeah. in 2013, the payments continued, so they don't continue well, I, now because I'll I've let, looked at a lot of facts. You can ask the OMB director that in a minute because I know you have him coming on. But, but it's quite a volatile thing to say they're not getting paid. Yeah, they, they, they are don't, getting they get, paid. Their, pays, their payment gets deferred. They don't. Why get, can't? They don't get why paid. Why couldn't Congress have fixed that? Uh, we did. We passed a bill. It's sitting in the Senate. They've. They why didn't? They, but why didn't the, the Democrats didn't filibuster the payment for the troops separate? The bill we the, passed the, pays the, the troops. It pays the Park Service. It pays the Border Patrol. It pays people doing basic health research. Right. But in 2013, when there was a shutdown, they did, in fact, get paid. No, right? they get, their pay gets deferred. Here, let me just say something. I believe in immigration reform. What if I persuaded my caucus to say, I'm going to shut down the government. I'm not going to pay our bills unless I get my way. It's a politics of idiocy, confrontation, and paralysis. That's Chuck Schumer in 2013. You're taking all the quotes I'm going to read. I know. You're you're I'm, later, I'm saving you but time. But, no, but no, my but point the, is, I'm trying to get answers from you, My Mr. point Speaker. is, this is ridiculous. 
I Open the government back up, and then we'll get back to negotiating. But let me go back to this. You said that the ad is not productive. Here's the, here's the concern people have. This is a fight over this moment, okay? But it's opening up this larger, pretty ugly debate. That ad suggests, basically, the Democrats are for the dangerous people. We're for the good Americans. When it gets into that kind of a debate, it gets very elemental, and you start doing, saying things and creating wounds that can't be healed. So Do we you should worry about that? So we should open the government back up and resume negotiations, which were going on in earnest, in good faith, before they blew things up and shut down the government. Can you give me your assessment of the president as a negotiator on this DACA question? Yeah, I talk to him all the time about it. It's what I just said. He wants, in addition to a DACA solution, he wants to secure the border, including the border wall. Here's the problem. If we have an illegal immigration problem, and we say we're going to give legal status to this group of people, as sympathetic as they are, and we don't, I don't want to see these kids deported. And then you don't fix the problem, you're going to have more people saying, ah, come to the country illegally, sooner or later I'll get an amnesty. That's a bad incentive structure. So what you want to do is fix the root cause of the problem. We don't have control Here's of our borders. We have a broken immigration system while we address this symptom of the problem. That's what the president is saying, and that's perfectly common sense. Uh, well, let me ask you about Congress, though, here. This has been a problem for a while, DACA, as has the Children's Health Insurance Program. In a functioning Congress, when, when DACA is thrown back into Congress to deal with, you work through the process, you get a piece of legislation, you vote on it. The same is with reauthorizing children's health insurance. Those things have not been tended to by Congress. Do you know why? We've passed it three times now in the House. We have passed... So is this all the Senate's We've fault? passed the CHIP program. This is the third chip long-term reauthorization we have passed in the house and the senate democrats have been filling up bustering it each and every time we passed all 12 appropriation bills for all of government last september in the house and the senate democrats have been filibustering those bills we passed in december funding for these natural disasters and the hurricanes and the senate democrats have been filibustering these bills so the point i'm trying to make john is the senate democrats have chosen filibuster chip filibuster appropriations, filibuster getting these things done, and then blame the dysfunction on everybody else. The point I'm trying to make well, is, if you want to get these problems solved, open up the government, resume negotiations, and let's solve these problems. But their argument would be, if you want to get these problems solved in a Senate where you know you need 60 votes, when you have, uh, you need to do a little outreach and, and be ready if you're going to say it's my way or the highway, be Why don't you just bring a bill to the floor and start appropriations? Let's take appropriations. Well, or what shift. about DACA? Why not bring something? You know you could get a bipartisan majority for DACA in the House and the Senate. The president would be on his desk in minutes. Bring bills to the floor and see where they go on, on appropriations. Bring bills to the floor to see where they go on all these other issues. The pro here's the problem. Mm -hmm. The Democrats filibuster even considering these bills, and that is why we have this big pileup. But they're and with respect to DACA, it's really important. We want to fix the root cause of the problem while we address the symptom of the problem. That's perfectly common sense. And just so you know, John, we had good faith negotiations on this issue underway. Well, until the Senate Democrats chose to shut down the, the Democrats can, can talk, speak for themselves, but their argument is the, they weren't in good faith. The president said, I'll take a deal. A deal was put before him, then he, then he wouldn't take it. But on this question of DACA, why not? I put, would take issue with that, but go ahead. Well, uh, there is a bipartisan agreement that could be put on the floor of the Senate. The question that, is whether That's one that we don't support, House. and it was, it was an end run around the negotiations we had. The pres it was, so we had a negotiating format up. They brought other, another bill, end run around it. The president doesn't support it. We don't support it. So what we're saying is, Let's stick with these negotiations. We had Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader of the House, Steny Hoyer, the majority whip, Dick Durbin, the majority, minority whip, and, and, and John Cornyn, the, the majority whip of the Senate. In negotiations, they try to bring some end run around it that the president, they, he doesn't support, that we wouldn't support. We will support a bill that the president supports to fix this problem, and that means fixing this problem more comprehensively so we don't have another DACA problem five, mm -hmm. 10 years down the Let road. Let me ask you a final political question. 2018, there are some retirements. Are you going to be a uh, speaker if you have the majority in the next Congress? Yeah, After these speaker, elections? The yeah, if we keep the majority, then, then the Republican speaker. You're asking me if I'm going to run for re-election? That's a decision my wife and I always make each and every term when we have filing in Wisconsin late in spring. And I even, I'm not going to share, share my thinking with you before I even talk to my wife. Well, it's my last <laughs> so, show, Mr. Yeah, speaker. Yeah, yeah, so uh, it's so look, we're doing here. fine. I have no plans of going anywhere anytime soon. But that's something that my wife and I always decide in the, in late spring of the election. You're still having, uh, what's your, what do yeah, you feel? Yeah, well, I'm not having job. fun in a government shutdown. I like to get back to work and, and make sure that we don't defund chip and, and stop okay. funding our troops. Mr. Speaker, thanks for being here. Congratulations.
We turn now to White House Budget Director Mick Mulvaney to discuss where the administration stands in this impasse. Welcome, Mr. Director. John, it's a pleasure to be here on your last show. Congratulations on the new gig. Thank you. Uh, the president said this shutdown would be a present for him. His son, uh, Eric Trump, said this is good for um, good for the, the administration. Why is it good for the administration? I don't think it's good for the administration. I think the present comment is correct in that I think one of the reasons you asked Mr. Ryan at one of the questions about why are we doing this? Why, is, why, why are we here right now? And I think part of the reason is that this is the first anniversary of the president's inauguration. And I think the left wing of the, of the Democrat Party is extraordinarily disappointed with how the first year has gone because the president's had a good many successes. The tax bill, the success in the, uh, in the stock markets, the advances that we've had in a employment, the economy, and so forth. And I think one of the reasons you're seeing the Democrats pick this fight right now, and the reason that it is different than it has been in the past, is because we here we are on the first anniversary, should be talking about the successes, and instead we're talking about a shutdown. But why is it considered a present, though, and why is it good? People, and, and you even said it was cool to shut down the government. People are, on the one hand, being told this is a, a great disaster for military families and all that, and then these other signals are being yeah, sent. Well, my comment was that I just thought it was interesting from an academic standpoint that after all I've been through in Washington, D.C., to learn on Friday afternoon that the person who actually physically sends the instructions to in, uh, sort of shut the government down to go through the lapse in appropriations is the director of the Office of Management and Budget, which is me. It didn't mean that I liked it. I think the administration has been very straightforward from the beginning. We do not want this shutdown, and that's why you've seen the president work so hard and why we're so frustrated that Senate Democrats can't seem to figure out a way to get to yes. Here's, I'm confused about this military thing. Here's what Congressman Mulvaney said in 2013 during the last shutdown about uh, about it. You said, in fact, about 75% of the government is open for business. Mm -hmm. um, and so you said back then, you said, in the meantime, you should know that our troops are still being paid and Social Security checks are still going out. So why was it true in 2013 when you said these troops are still being paid and not true now? A couple of different things. First of all, Social Security checks do go out and will go out. Social Security is not impacted by any government shutdown because the money is mandatory and not appropriated. On the military, here's how it works, and I have a much greater understanding of a shutdown now that I'm the OMB director. Um, they will go to work. They do go to work. Folks who are in the military, overseas, uh, folks here at home, will go to work. They just don't automatically get paid. What has to happen is Congress has to go back after the shutdown is over and vote to pay them for the time during the furlough. Claire McCaskill, Senator, uh, Democratic Senator, brought up a vote to, to pay them while the shutdown was going on. That vote didn't, uh, Mitch McConnell didn't bring that up for a vote. Why doesn't, why wouldn't Congress, uh, why wouldn't the, the White House the executive branch do everything they can to take care of the troops uh, while this is being adjudicated? A couple different things on that. Yeah, I understand several of those uh, unanimous consent requests came up in the Senate on both sides. For example, yeah. the, I think Ms. McConnell also brought up a unanimous consent request to take a vote today before 1 o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning, and that was objected to. I think when you get to those unanimous consent requests, those are procedural votes, and it goes to the sort of the, the, the dynamic flow in the Senate. But as to the impact of the shutdown on people, the president made it very clear to me Friday night. We talked late Friday, right before the lapse came into place, and he said, look, I want you to do everything you can to make sure this impacts as few people as possible. We are going to run and are running the shutdown very differently now than the Obama administration ran it in 2013. You cannot convince me that the Obama administration did not weaponize this for political purposes. The president has told me, make sure as many people can go to work on Monday as they can. Make sure you use every tool legally available to you to keep as much of the government open, and that's what we'll do. Because people are saying that's what the administration Republicans are doing, that word you used, weaponize, which is essentially saying things about the military that are not true in order to put political pressure on uh, yeah, Democrats. Let's, let's be perfectly clear on the military. And on uh, the, the same is true for the military folks. The same is true for the folks guarding the southern border, the folks fighting fires. They have to go to work. They will go to work. They will be continuing to guard the country and do the necessary and, and important work that they're doing, but they have no guarantee of getting paid, uh, and that's not right. But they will get paid at some point. Traditionally, every single time in a shutdown, Congress has voted to go and pay them retroactively, and we support that. And do you have any doubt that they will not be paid? Uh, no, I absolutely believe, well, I, I tell you, 
Congress, uh, I never thought we'd get to this because we've got, again, you asked Mr. Ryan a question, what's different? This bill would have passed in a previous Congress. This bill is something that the Senate Democrats are opposing, but they don't oppose. Uh, and that's that's new, that's, that's a strange new world uh, in Washington politics. I want to get your views on what I was talking about with the speaker, which is the larger kind of atmosphere and talk about immigration here. The Attorney General said this this week, what good does it do to bring in somebody who is illiterate in their own country? has no skills and is going to struggle in our new country and not be successful. In 2015, uh, Dave Weigel, who was then with Bloomberg, interviewed you and you said, I've heard a lot of arguments about unskilled labor, but if that were the case, my family would, have, would, have, would not have gotten in here from Ireland. They were unskilled workers and they helped build this country. It's not quite xenophobia, you said, but it's moving that way. Are we moving towards xenophobia in the no, way this is being talked about? I think about? what we're moving towards is, is a recognition that the immigration system of the 21st century in the United States needs to be different than it was in the 19th century when my family came here. Every other developed nation now has a system where you have to show merit. You have mm -hmm. to show that you're going to contribute to the economy. In fact, even if you go back to the 19th century when my folks came in, and I think yours did as well, um, they had to have a certificate that said they would not be wards of the state. And I think that's what we're trying to get back to the point where we want folks who will contribute to the economy that's why we want to move away from chain migration and over towards a merit basis. But when you said this in 2015, it wasn't the 19th century. So you were making a claim about the, the tenor of things, and some people are worried that things have ended up right exactly as you predicted in 2015 with a, with a message of xenophobia rather than a traditionally welcoming American yeah, message. We are interested in folks coming into this country who can contribute. I don't think that ever qualifies as xenophobia. All right, Mr. Director, thank you so much for being with us. We've, we're out of time. We'll be back in a minute with the number two Senate Democrat, Richard Durbin. You can't predict the market, but through good working to be better. And we're back with the Senate Democratic whip, Richard Durbin. Senator, welcome. There seems to be a deal in conversation about opening the government up, funding it for a few more weeks. If there's a promise, there will be an ultimate vote on DACA. Is that something Democrats can agree to? Well, I can tell you, we're working on it on a bipartisan basis, and I'm glad we are. I'm sorry we're in this situation, but I think it bears repeating how we got here. The, Demo the Republicans are in control of every branch of government, uh, the presidency, of course, the House, the Senate, through their nominees, the Supreme Court, and the Republicans are in complete control of the business that comes before the House and the Senate. Uh, Speaker Ryan, who's a friend of mine, another Midwesterner, uh, he overlooks the fact that the president challenged us on September the 5th to deal with the DACA problem. And as yet, we haven't seen any hearings on any bills in the Senate. But the Senate needs 60 votes, and Democrats are the ones who voted to not get to 60, and, and that didn't is vote, I should but say. Let me just add that I think this is key, and why we call it the Trump shutdown. There was an effort made at the invitation of President Trump for Chuck Schumer to come to the White House on Friday and avoid this. They sat down for lunch, four of them, both President Schumer, each of them brought their age, John Kelly and Mike Lynch, and they reached a basic agreement. In that agreement, Chuck Schumer made major concessions to the president to get this job done. Right. Two hours later, the White House called and said it's over. We're not interested. But, and I want to get to those concessions in a minute. But okay, so there's a little sloppiness. Why not keep the government open and figure it out over the next few little period? You guys, you're pretty close. This Why the, shut the government down? This is the fourth continuing resolution. There's been a consistent failure by the Republican leadership in Congress to deal with these critical issues. We don't want to see this situation as it currently exists, but we want to see a solution that has meaning and one that will serve this nation. We're lurching from one continuing re resolution to the next. Do you know what the Secretary of the Navy said? Continuing resolutions have cost the United States Navy $4 billion. Well, that Enough for us to make sure not only sailors are paid, but that we build the resources we need to keep the nation safe. But here's the thing, Democrats are, are contributory in this mess everybody is in. And by choosing to force this into a shutdown situation, everybody's now going to their corners, the president's running the kind of ads he is. Is Does that befoul things so badly that you can't get an agreement? It doesn't have to. Do you remember January 9th, you might have seen when the president left the cameras on in the cabinet room and we sat with him? I was sitting right next to him. It was the fourth time we'd ever had a conversation. And we were talking about DACA and Dreamers. And the president said, you send me a bill and I will sign it. Within 48 hours, Lindsey Graham, Republican of South Carolina and I presented a bill to him which was summarily rejected. So what happened to Schumer happened to us. Senator, we can't reach the agreement we need for this nation without leadership from a president. Let me interrupt you there. We'll be right back. Senator, hold on a moment. We'll need to take a break, but we've got more questions for the senator and we'll be right back. Stay with us. 
And we'll be right back with a lot more Face the Nation, more with Senator Richard Durbin and our political panel, plus some final thoughts on my last regular broadcast. Stay with us. Welcome back to Face the Nation and our conversation with the number two Democrat in the Senate, Richard Durbin. Senator, I want to read you some quotes here from various people, including Senator Schumer, who in 2015 sent a government shutdown would deal a huge blow to our economy. Bernie Sanders said it is wrong for the right wing Republicans to ignore the results of the last election and hold the American people hostage by threatening to shut down the government. You said open the government when you open the government will open negotiations. So why was it bad then and okay now? It's not uh, a good thing to do at any point. Uh, we've reached a desperate situation. This was the fourth continuing resolution. The Republican-controlled Congress has refused to fund the government, been unable to fund the government. They can't resolve the issues within their own ranks. And so they give us one continuing resolution after the next. And now we are piling up all the things that need to be done. And now we are facing a deadline created by President Trump when it comes to DACA. So we feel there's an urgency for us to come together and do it quickly. And I hope it's just a matter of hours or days. But we need to have a substantive answer. And the only person who can lead us to that is President Trump. This is his shutdown. The de they obviously say it's yours and that's what we're in. But, but the deadline's not till March. Why shut things down now? Listen, it's been four and a half months since President Trump set this deadline and said that 780,000 young people who are protected in this country from deportation and can legally work are going to start losing that protection 1,000 a day on March 5th. What have the Republicans in the Senate done in the four and a half months since? Nothing. What we have done, three Republican, three Democratic senators, is to craft a bill to put this bill before our colleagues and to put it before the president on a bipartisan basis. We're trying to solve the problem the president created. Speaker Ryan, you heard him, he was out here, he said they've had their solutions on DACA, but it's the Senate Democrats who are filibustering. What he said, unfortunately, and Paul's my friend, is he refers to this bipartisan negotiation, Kevin McCarthy, whom I like very much. We've been doing this for 12 days. 12 days with this deadline looming. Our, our bill that we crafted, our bipartisan bill, took four months. We took it seriously. We took the president's invitation to offer a bill seriously, as Chuck Schumer did when he went down to the White House. President Donald Trump has to step up and lead us at this point. He can do it. You know, you, you've gone back to the president's comments where he said, I'll take whatever bill. But it's perfectly reasonable for a president to, to take into consideration all the moving pieces. If he, vote, if he says, OK, we'll go with the Durbin bill, that'll never pass the House. Plus, he's got his own constituencies. I mean, he's allowed to change his mind, isn't he? Of course he is. But at some point, he has to make a decision. Make a decision about whether or not we're going to go forward as a nation. That's what we've been waiting on. And, and as we look at this issue, whether it's DACA or the larger agenda that Chuck Schumer has addressed, he'll make a decision, he'll embrace it, and with two, within two hours do a pirouette and be off in another direction. What is the position among Democrats right now on funding the wall? The president wants uh, $18 billion or $20 billion. Is there a number now that Democrats are... Chuck Schumer made a significant offer to the president, and it wasn't just an authorization, although I think that is the way you run a government. You authorize a project, and then you say to the administration, give us your plans. How are you going to spend the money? We don't want to waste it. But he also made a concession to the president on actual appropriations, so the president would not be slowed down at all. Do you know how much money from the 2017 appropriation for walls and fences and barriers has been spent so far? One percent. Did he meet the president's terms in that meeting? I think he did because the president said we have an understanding. Two hours later called him and said it's off. Let me ask you about that Oval Office meeting. It's been adjudicated like crazy, but you have Republican senators questioning you. What does that make the cloakroom like when you're passing them? Do you say, hey, wait a minute, you've said I told an untruth and don't go doing that? Do you have, I mean, does, it should lead to confrontation of some John, sort. I stand by every word. My Republican colleagues know exactly what the president said, and I do too. Uh, I was the only Democrat in the room. At least one other Republican, Lindsey Graham, has said that I was accurate in what I said. Uh, others have said they've forgotten. We had the Secretary Nielsen of DHS. She seemed to forget the words that were said. I can't forget them. All right, Senator Durbin, thanks so much for being with us, and we'll be right back with our panel. It's time for some political analysis. Joining us now, Ruth Marcus, columnist and deputy editorial page editor of The Washington Post. Jeffrey Goldberg, editor of The Atlantic. Ben Dominich is founder and publisher of The Federalist. 
And Ed O'Keefe covers Capitol Hill for the Washington Post and is a CBS News contributor. Ed, I want to start with you. Where are we right now? Well, see, I, th I think this is all because you're leaving town. Uh, we would call this the Dickerson shutdown. Uh, look. <laughs> 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 uh, we'll not go viral. Right. <laughs> uh, look, the, the Senate reconvenes this afternoon. House Republicans are huddling this afternoon to try to figure out what might happen among them. There is a group of moderate senators who are meeting in the offices of Susan Collins trying to sort of see if there's enough support to reopen the government till February 8th and then slam out all the unfinished business, which might include immigration or it might not. And, and the reason this group thinks they have a chance is because Majority Leader McConnell has said to them, if you get everything else done, disaster funding, the actual budget, uh, reauthorizing the children's health insurance program, but you can't do immigration, I'll give you a vote on immigration separately. And that might be a few different options. And then at that point, it will require the president and House Republicans to signal which one they like, and then maybe that issue gets resolved. So could be a late night, uh, but we're not there yet. Ben, uh, okay, we just saw a lot of who shot John yes. here, uh, despite John's <laughs> attempts to try to figure out who's doing the shooting. What, take us, we're going to all try and rise up out of this for a moment. What does this mean? Is there a bigger thing here, or is this just a spat and we're going to be moving on to the next thing? I think this is the perfect way to end the first year of the Trump presidency, <laughs> which is that this is a tale of two presidencies, in the sense that, on the one hand, if you had rewound the clock and told Paul Ryan two years ago that two years from now you're going to have a Republican president, you'll have passed the most significant tax reform since Ronald Reagan, you'll have an economy that's booming, wages that are increasing, unemployment is going to be down, you'll have withdrawn from the Paris climate deal, you'll have mostly killed ISIS, you would be have a very happy Paul Ryan, yeah. except that you also have to tell him that even though 58% of the people uh, you know, approve of the presidency on the economy, 58% of them are also opposed to him or unfavorable to him, as uh, Ed O'Keefe's Washington Post most recently said this week, which indicates basically that we're at this point where we have to ask ourselves, is it still the economy stupid? Right. Is that really the most important thing? Or is the kind of craziness that has come with, under, with this presidency and with the constant negotiation, not just you know via uh, the White House meetings, but via television, via his tweets, et cetera, has that had enough of an impact that it now puts Republicans on a road toward a very difficult 2018 midterm? And Ruth, uh, Democrats are taking advantage of what they think is the answer to Ben's question, which is this is an unpopular president. We want to win points with our constituency by Get having a shutdown here and making Republicans putting them in a bad spot with an unpopular president. Sure, and that's understandable. I think the reality of a shutdown is whoever wins the excuse me, whoever wins the battle of the hashtags, hashtag Schumer shutdown, hashtag Dickerson shutdown, hashtag Trump shutdown. Uh, everybody, nobody wins. Everybody loses. It drags down everybody to the extent that it does. And then people forget it. People are going to particularly forget it in this kind of disaster episode, you know, craziness du jour Washington that we're living in. So the question is, Wait, what makes this shutdown different from all other shutdowns? And the answer, I did that for Goldberg. Um, and the answer is, this is the first one party shutdown we've had. And so we have this situation where the president and a Congress, both houses which are controlled by his own party, can't even get the government funded. I know, 51 votes, everything yeah, else. Well, that's but not that's important. the But you know, that's the reality. And you know, that's, those are the rules that you're living with. Right. Work it out. The, you know, uh, talking about who's going to forget this and who's not, you know who's not going to forget this? The Chinese leadership. They're not going to forget this moment. They're watching, talk about a one-party shutdown. They think to themselves, well, we have one party and we don't shut down our government. Uh, the issue is, the issue is the signaling here. Over and over again, this country is signaling to allies and adversaries that it can't run itself. Um, that's the lasting impact of this. And I think if you talk about what lifting up and thinking about what does this mean in the long term, yeah, we'll forget this shutdown, but other people won't. And people are watching around the world and thinking this is a completely dysfunctional country. I have to say, dispute a little bit this, uh, this meme that has been out there quite a lot that this is a one party shutdown. The government shut down five times under Carter, including with significant Democratic majorities. The difference is that shutdown was fundamentally different because of the different ways that people were being paid. It, it wasn't a real was shutdown. It, the, it didn't yeah, shut yes, things down. But, but so that's see, it but see, now we're doing the meaning of shutdown. But, see, yes. I think, but I think the meaning of shutdown also shifts too. I mean, Mick Mulvaney was a fan of, 
of shutting down the he government sure was. Uh, back in 2013 in almost exactly the same scenario where you're shutting it down over an issue that is not related to continuing to run the government. There is always a strain of, of uh, conservatism that believes, as Jesse Helms did, that every day these buildings are closed, the republic grows stronger. Um, and that's something that does, I think, have a real strain within it. I actually don't think, though, that this one will have the kind of political consequences long-term simply because the one in 2013 didn't play out the way right. that we thought. Yeah, the, Republicans got blamed in the well, short term. The and news cycle is so frenetic right. that yeah. we'll move to the next crisis. We aren't even talking about the doctor's uh, you know, press conference the other day. You know? um, <laughs> or other things. Ed, yeah, Ed, um, let's bring the president into this. Yeah. Um, it, again, regardless of where anybody wants to place blame, the president is not absent from participation in American government. And this one made specific promises about fixing the kind of messed up situation that we are now presently in. What's the, what's the accurate way to think about the president's role in this? The accurate way, I think, is that that Tuesday meeting, most of which was televised, was it was a breakthrough moment that a lot of people thought was going to avoid what we're now dealing with. But that Thursday confrontation where bad words were used probably sealed the fate of, of the situation we're in, simply because they brought to him what he asked for, a bipartisan agreement. The problem is certain supporters of his weren't involved in that bipartisan agreement. But you don't need Tom Cotton necessarily to pass something in the House and the Senate. You don't, but, Jeffrey, the, the, John Kelly, when, he, when Brett Baer interviewed him, said... Bringing in those conservative viewpoints is my job to put all the information in front of the yeah. president. So that doesn't may not that may mess up the deal, but it's the way a White House is supposed to work. Right. Well, well, the interesting thing here is that what he's showing is that he's he's uh, he knows the art of the instigation, but the art of negotiation is really eluding him. And and I, I do find it interesting. And and what you're hearing inside the White House is that we don't know what he thinks, and we don't think he has the attention span to bear down on these issues. So the shut down is in part a product of drift, uh, leaderless drift. I, I, I want to follow up on that because you've um, sort of alluded a few times to the president's statement in at the convention in Cleveland, mm. I alone can fix it. Well, it turns out that, first of all, you can't fix Washington alone, no mm. president can, and also that he may be uniquely ill-suited to fix this situation. Uh, uh, Senator Schumer said negotiating with him was like uh, negotiating with Jello. I've made a Jello mold or two in my day, and I'd like to say I think that's unfair to Jello because Jello, once it sets, keeps its shape. <laughs> this this is a president whose shapes shifts depending on who the last person is he spoke to, and the way that people, his chief of staff, the Senate Majority Leader, are talking about him. We have to wait till he figures out what he thinks. He's evolving. Is really pretty remarkable, and it goes to those two presidents that Ben was talking but, about. But and with other presidents, Clinton, FDR, the shape-shifting and the telling one person one thing and the next person the next thing was considered actually a talent and an art. Right. So just having multiple positions in, is not by itself bad for a president. Some people think it's crucial. Yeah, and, and because in those cases, they were, they were shifting to cut a deal and they kept in that position. The problem with this guy is, you know, 9 a.m. he's here, 3 o'clock he's here, 8 o'clock he's somewhere else. And, and that is part of the struggle that Republicans especially will tell you makes this yeah. difficult. And Depends I if it's strategic or not. Right. And b before we add to whatever you were going to say so to this, which the, is this art of instigation, yes. that ad being run by the Trump campaign in this context. How do you see that ad and then add whatever you uh, want? There's a, a line from Chesterton that politicians and opposition are expert in the means to some end, and in office, they are an expert on the obstacles to it. I think that the fact is that Trump was, as, as a candidate, not someone as uh, entirely familiar with the obstacles, namely something like needing to get a sufficient Democrat votes to continue to have this government running under a continuing resolution. But I also think that part of what you're seeing here with Kelly bringing those other conservative voices in speaks to something uh, interesting about this president's first year, which is that it has been a much more conservative year than I think we could have oh, expected yeah. from candidate Trump. He is much more conservative as a president uh, than generic Republican. You know, in terms, if you think of generic Republican as being Mitt Romney or someone along those lines, he has been much more aggressive. I think you saw that this week in terms of, of Washington experiencing the pro-life March for Life that happens every year, followed by the Women's March on the other side. This, uh, it's not just his nature, it's not just the craziness, it's also the ideology that has created a very tribal 
environment, and I don't think that's going away anytime soon. There is this interesting phenomenon going on. Uh, Ben's colleague uh, Molly Hemingway just wrote that, that she's elated that the president turned out well, not to be progressive. That, uh, one of the local Washington newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and it was fascinating because there were such low expectations on the part of conservatives that he would actually be dispositionally conservative. So mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those sort of markers of a year that, 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 that John Kelly is bringing him these conservatives use, but he's, he's very receptive to them. It's not as if there's an argument to sort of move him to the right. Mm -hmm. Right, a way in which maybe his shifting positions have in the end helped conservatives rather than, um, Ruth, let me ask you this question about the point Ben made, which is it may not be the economy stupid. In our, in our poll, 67% say the economy is very or fairly good, but the president's approval rating is 37%. What does that disconnect mean, if anything? Because um, the president should have better approval ratings than the economy is doing so well. A president with an economy this good should have better approval ratings. No president at the end of his first term has ever had approval ratings this low. Therefore, something is going on that tells us precisely what you said. It's not the economy stupid. And if you look underneath at some of the other questions that are asked, people are rattled by this president. They are rattled by, they may be happy or unhappy about his ideology, but m many of them have had questions, I think, in the Washington Post poll about whether he was mentally stable. Mm -hmm. That is a scary moment in American democracy. Unfortunately, I gotta, I gotta cut it there. Oh, that's so, right. Well, I want to thank <laughs> <laughs> you guys but are my not. favorite part of this show, but I'm afraid Jeffrey's about to interrupt. No, I'm sorry, John, but we actually want to seize control of the show from you uh, <laughs> for the last time. minute. Or, yeah, it's a long, long time coming. The, um, we uh, want to turn this into a little bit of a Trump cabinet meeting <laughs> and go around the horn and, and praise you. And I would start by simply saying that we've all enjoyed your hosting, your moderating, and we think that your civility and restraint and persistence and intelligence have been a great boon to us and a great boon to your viewers. Thank and you. John, I would like to say that I feel blessed to have sat around this table with your broad-shouldered leadership. <laughs> um, Ruth starring as Mike Pence. <laughs> No one has ever said that before. And on a more serious note, might get a little choked up here. Um, Washington is part of your DNA. It's part of your heritage. It's part of your heart. We're not sending you to New York. We're just loaning. We're just loaning you to New York. We expect you back. Thank you, John. You are honorable, decent, and fair, which is something that is very rare in Washington. And even rarer still, you've managed to be those things while remaining very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we will miss you very much, and we know the best is yet to come. And one of the things that viewers may not appreciate is I talked to people up at the Capitol when this announcement was made, and they said, you know, he's the only one of the guys that hosts one of these shows that actually still shows up up here. <laughs> he still reports. And, and one of the dirty secrets is that sometimes people get these jobs and they don't do that anymore. And you have, and it is widely appreciated. Thank you. Bravo, Thanks to all John. of you. Thank you. Just as I wrote them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll miss you all, and we'll be back in a moment. This week, former Senate Majority Leader and 1996 Republican presidential nominee Bob Dole was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. He showed his trademark wit. I want to thank all of those who have said such kind words about me. They're probably not true, but they were nice. And his generosity. And I also want to thank my colleagues For without them, nothing would have been accomplished. As we were looking over his career, there are plenty of echoes to today. As Congress tries to break out of the government shutdown, we were reminded of Dole's role in a bipartisan attempt to avert a shutdown in 1991 and his appeal to compromise. The naysayers, the nitpickers may have a field day because the easy vote in this case is to find something you don't like and vote no. But in my view, we owe more to the American people than finding fault with what I consider to be a good agreement. And as the president defends himself against charges of racism, Dole's words at the 1996 Republican convention have also been circulating on social media. But if there's anyone who has mistakenly attached himself to our party in the belief that we are not open to citizens of every race and religion, then let me remind you, Tonight, this hall belongs to the party of Lincoln, and the exits, which are clearly marked, 
are for you to walk out of as I stand this ground without compromise. Senator Dole has been a guest on Face the Nation 63 times, and his career also touched the lives of two of us on this show. Me, as a young reporter covering his campaign for Time magazine and in need of a haircut, and our executive producer, Mary Hager, covering him for CBS both as a campaign embed and on Capitol Hill. For recognition of a career serving and sacrificing for his country. Congratulations, Senator Dole. Back in a moment. In the hallway to the Face the Nation offices, there is a picture from the last presidential campaign. The staff is gathered around our executive producer, Mary Hager's computer. We're staring at the famous Billy Bush tape just after it was released. That picture represents something fundamental about this show, which I will leave today as the full-time host. That was an extraordinary moment, but the picture captures what we do each week. We look hard at the news and then launch into the same thing that happened after that picture was taken. We throw ourselves into trying to figure out what something means and who we can bring on the show to help us understand it better. It is a group effort. I have had the privilege for the last two and a half years of meeting you here for an hour each Sunday. What you don't see are the other 167 hours in the week when all the people you don't see are working to make our hour together go smoothly. It starts almost the minute we go off the air when executive producer Mary Hager is already thinking about who we should book for the next show. Arrayed all around me right now are the people who get up long before the sun and work long after it has gone down, who chase down the host's every last query, save him from getting a fact wrong, coax the teleprompter, replace a guest who has gotten sick at the last minute, frame the shot, keep the batteries fresh in the microphone packs, poke all these lights over my head, Search for the right interview location. Wrangle time, space, and security guards at those locations when we take the show on the road. Chase reluctant public officials. Keep my forehead from looking shiny. And drain pot after pot of coffee in the edit room. They give up their weekends and they give up planning. Because when you work in the news, birthdays, anniversaries, and commitments to your kids and your parents get overturned. They do all of this because they are committed. They want to tell you what's going on as best as we can figure it, and believe that we can give you some control over your world by helping you understand it. I'm proud of what they do and proud to have been a part of doing it alongside them. To all of you out there, thank you for your trust, your loyalty, and your generosity. I'm moving on to CBS this morning, but maybe I'll be lucky enough to come back and fill in someday. You're in good hands, though, as you've always been. For Face the Nation, I'm John Dickerson.